so glad that you're here this morning to, uh, to enjoy worship with us together. On behalf of my dear colleague, uh, Reverend Dr. Garth Allen, who's preaching this morning, by the way, at Sabbath Day Point. That's why he's not with us. Can everybody hear me okay? Is that not loud enough and good enough? We're so grateful you have come uh, to worship with us this morning. We, um, we've been in the auditorium the last three weeks, and now as we move through the summer, we move into our chapel, and it's a little more intimate for us, and we have a, less of a crowd. But, you know, you're the real believers. You are the real believers. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. We said goodbye to so many people on Saturday who were with us this past week, and we had our EMP um, uh, gathering last night, EMP ending ceremony, and we said goodbye to many of our EMPs, a very tearful, beautiful event uh, in the store. And so we sort of start to transition into uh, a little bit later August. But, but worship continues. If you look on the back of your bulletin, we have worship uh, right on through uh, the middle of October. And um, we hope that you're uh, able to stay with us as long as, you, as you're here with us. Next week, we have a choir. Uh, uh, communion will be at 8.30, our choir at 9 next week. And I'll have an, app, an opportunity to preach at 10. So that's uh, going on next Sunday. Um, I do want to just a couple of brief announcements. Eric Keys has a concert on September 1st. It's Wednesday, a week from this Wednesday, here at the chapel at 8 o'clock. So we'll look forward to that, Eric, and that concert. Um, do we have enough bulletins back there for everybody? Did we, do we have enough bulletins? Yeah, thanks, Bev. Just we can hand those out to people who might need them. Yeah, Linda needs a bulletin here. We, yeah, I think we got plenty back there. Are there any more? This is a nice problem to have, to run out of bulletins. We printed 400, and look at this. <laughs> this is amazing. No. A um, couple other things to uh, thanks, thank Austin for uh, making this real. He gets us on tape, and this goes up on the Silver Bay YouTube page about 3 o'clock today. And I just want to say a really warm welcome to all of those that are at home uh, who will watch this uh, later today or sometime this week. Thank you so much for joining us. Many of you have been with us earlier this summer and are now home and are, are watching us on our YouTube channel. Blessings to all of you that are at home today and hope this worship uh, blesses you. Thank you for being with us. Um, and I also want to thank again Eric for the beautiful music that he provides for us uh, each week. We do have refreshments thanks to Paul and Barb Folkemer. Refreshments will be outside in the garden uh, after our service. Please join us um, uh, at that point. I would like to um, uh, say a couple other really pretty exciting things. I was with a group of UCC pastors yesterday. We had a meeting and it was announced that the the annual UCC New York Conference, which has been with us some years ago, for a number of years, is coming back June of 2022, which we're so grateful for. So that conference will kick us off. We're really pleased that the UCC, we're hoping two or 300 people and we get beyond COVID and all that, but that's a really exciting thing. Banjo Camp is this week. Do we have any uh, people in Banjo Camp here this morning that are part of Banjo Camp? We've got a few banjo players here. We have about 75 people coming. You'll start to hear bluegrass music all through the campus uh, this week. It's wonderful to have Bluegrass Camp with us. And uh, uh, they have a few uh, events going on uh, this week. So um, if you enjoy bluegrass music, this is a, a, great, way to be, a great week to be around uh, Silver Bay. Um, I do want to also, uh, well, any announcements from you all? Anything to lift up? Birthdays, anniversaries? Um, you know what? There's a one-year anniversary for this dear couple right here. Could you guys just stand for a second? Dan and his dear wife. One-year anniversary. We married them last year. And uh, we are back to celebrate their anniversary. Thank you guys so much for being with us. Hey, yes. Sixty, sixty-seven. Dinny and Bob Allen. That's yeah, over. Yeah, fifty-seven. Oh, fifty-seven. 57. I'm sorry. Five seven. Five seven. I gave them an extra ten years. Yeah. yeah. Fifty-seven. Well, congratulations. And Bob is doing much better physically. We understand. Yeah. No good. Thanks. Thanks, Marge. Any other things to lift up this morning for us? I do want to introduce our guest preacher. We're so grateful that. Um, 
James Calvin Davis, Dr. James Calvin Davis is with us from uh, Middlebury College. I want to read this. We are so grateful you're here. Thank you for being with us. And I really want you to know uh, about him. Um, Professor Davis began teaching at Middlebury College in 2001. And in 2019, he was appointed to the George Adams Ellis Chair of the Liberal Arts Department and previously had served the college as the assistant provost and then associate vice president for academic affairs. Um, Dr. Davis teaches courses in ethics and Christian studies with a particular interest in religion and ethics and politics in the US. He has written five books, his most recent one, American Liturgy, Finding Theological Meaning in the holy days of U.S. culture. That sounds really interesting to me. I'm looking forward to reading that. Thank you for uh, uh, for writing such uh, interesting stuff. I, I also was sharing with him the connection between Middlebury College and Silver Bay. They bring a group of students every year to, to Silver Bay for a conference. Also, many of us go to Middlebury for athletic events or concerts or lectures. We love uh, uh, the college being part of that. Their chaplain, Mark Ort Orton, is a big fan of Silver Bay. He's always coming on retreat in our Bookside Trinity Ministry program, along with his associate chaplains there at the college. So there's a nice connection, uh, James, between Silver Bay and Middlebury. And so you being with us just it's right into that connection now. Um, so I think those are all of all of our announcements. Any qu oh, the announcement went out about the the search committee uh, has released the the announcement about looking for a new executive director that went out this past week to all YMCA's across the nation. Um, it's being sent outside of the YMCA also. So you probably those of you that are on the Silver Bay. Um, email list probably saw that. It, it came from Mary Kay Paulston, who works for the YSA. So anyway, that's out there, and they'll start receiving resumes, and the search committee will begin their process in terms of looking for our next, uh, our next CEO. Keep that in prayer. It's a really important time for us that way. I just need to say one other thing. Julie Cook is with us this morning. Julie, could you just raise your hand? She's been on our staff in the past and just had moved away and now has come back to visit with us. So Julie, we're so grateful for your being here this morning. Anything else? Anybody else wants to lift up? Yes, Linda. Well, just to say that Albert Tonga from Turkey is with me now in New York. He came Friday night. And, he, and he's going to look for a job and live in New York City. And he said, he said to say hello. Yeah, he worked on our staff this summer beautifully. Ah, yeah. uh, yes, yeah. So summer, a number of people. Number so, and thank you for putting up, it seems to be a number of staff people leave here, they go by way of New York City and stay with Linda <laughs> in her apartment in New York City yeah, and yeah. then move out into the world. So thanks, Linda, for your, your hospitality there. Anything else for us this morning? We hope you have a great week. We hope that our worship this morning just blesses each and every one of us. Thank you again for being here. And as we begin worship, as we always do, let's just take a few moments just to be a little quiet together, uh, a moment for God's peace, maybe to lift up a prayer for somebody you know or maybe yourself, and then we'll begin with our call to worship. Please join me in our call to worship this morning, which is found in your bulletin. From the corners of worry and fear, from the shadows where we huddle with our doubts. God calls us to this place of sanctuary, where we can draw from love's deep wells. In every moment where we look for strength to continue, and every time wonder if faith is worth it. Jesus calls us to this time where we can welcome the peace given to us. In every person who embraces us with acceptance, in every touch that offers healing and hope, the Spirit calls us to see those around us as God's beloved, our sisters and brothers in Christ. Amen. And let us stand this, uh, and sing this opening hymn, We Gather Together, um, number 131.
Because each of us comes this morning with something on our heart. We come this morning, Lord, with open hearts and willing spirits. That you may, that you may touch us. That we might hear your still small voice. For we come this morning, Lord, continuing to seek a deepening relationship with you. And in that relationship, our call to build your kingdom here and beyond. So Lord, we would ask this morning that your Holy Spirit be present to us, that as we sing and pray and listen to your word, that we would come to be more the women and the men that you've called us to be. Strengthen us. Give us a humble heart. Help us to know a deeper sense of gratitude and help us to live out our call with compassion, forgiveness, and grace. So Lord, it's with a deep sense of humility that we lift up this prayer this morning to you. This we pray in your name and everyone together said, Amen. Our responsive reading is Psalm 100 on page 821. <clears throat> Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into God's presence with singing. Know that the Lord who made us is God. We are the Lord's. We are the people of God, the sheep of God's pasture. Enter God's gates with thanksgiving and God's courts with praise. We give thanks and bless God's name. For the Lord is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. God's faithfulness to all generations. Amen. So just to take a moment to, uh, for a moment for mission, um, we are YMCA and connected to YMCAs all around the world. Um, and a portion of our offering every Sunday goes to support that international work of the YMCA. I just tell you a brief story connected to this. I had a chance to work overseas for the YMCA many years ago and traveled around um, the Middle East and, and Northern Africa to see what the Ys were doing. And I was, uh, we were at the, the um, uh, Cairo YMCA in Egypt. We were at the Cairo YMCA and we were uh, attempting to learn what they were doing there and just being open and, and trying to be a, a sort of a, a gentle presence of, of the YUS, uh, YUSA, and um, as I was leaving to go back to the hotel, these two young boys, probably around 11 or 12, it was such a beautiful moment for me, 
they came running out, they came running out to catch up with me. We had talked earlier, uh, and they came running out, and they said, we have something for you. And they handed me this card, like a, a, a kind of, a, they had cut it out from a piece of paper, cardboard paper, whatever, and they had drawn a picture of Jesus on the card. And they said, we want you to have this. I still have it. It's just a moment that I'll always remember in terms of that. And those two boys probably now, this is 30 years ago, they are no doubt in their midlife. And I always wonder, I wonder what these two boys are doing now in terms of that. But this YMC movement that we're part of is just a spectacular um, worldwide organization that humbly goes about. And I keep thinking about my colleagues around the world um, who, are, who are working in my, many more harsher conditions and many more difficult places than we can imagine. And uh, my heart goes out to them. I also just want to lift up, and we can pray for this in our pastoral prayer, but I sent an email this morning to the executive director, a good friend of mine, who's the leader of the Long Island Y. And as that Y faces this hurricane, I know that they're going to be providing lots of services for people down in that part of the world. So anyway, long way around to saying thank you for whatever you're able to help us support the YMCA's around our country and around the world. Could we invite our choir to come up this morning? Good morning. 
It's so nice to be with you. Uh, I am, um, besides my uh, teaching at the college, I'm also an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church uh, USA and a member of Albany Presbytery. And for years, Albany Presbytery also uh, met once a year here at Silver Bay. And so I have very fond memories uh, of those meetings. But in all of those meetings, there was also uh, the advantage of being the closest meeting to me uh, at each year of Albany Presbytery. And in all of those meetings, I don't know that I was ever in this chapel. Um, so it is just what a gorgeous place um, uh, to worship. And so I'm very grateful to you all, to Bruce, to Garth, for the, uh, for the invitation to, to worship with you uh, this morning. Um, our scripture reading uh, is uh, Psalm 122. Listen to what the Spirit may be saying to us today. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem, built as a city that is bound firmly together. To it the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. For there the thrones for judgment were set up, the thrones of the house of David, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For the sake of my relatives and friends, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. This is the word of the Lord. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, the Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. For the past several weeks, I have been watching a CNN documentary, a mini series of sorts called Jerusalem city of faith and fury and I have uh, been enjoying it and learning a lot I will admit that there's a lot I didn't know about the fraught history of Jerusalem especially the modern part the the tug of war over the city that was instigated by Western colonialism so yes I'm learning a lot uh, from that show and of course what makes Jerusalem arguably the most conflicted place on earth is the number of communities who lay claim to that city and the historical depths of those claims. One historian on the show uh, invokes the saying, the past is never the past, and goes on to remark, if there is one place on the face of the earth where that is true, it is Jerusalem. The three Western monotheisms all lay claim to Jerusalem as a holy city, Jews regard Jerusalem as the capital of ancient Israel, the site of the Davidic throne, the, the site of the temple, in some ways, God's inhabitants on earth. Christians inherit this reverence for Jerusalem as part of our religion's Jewish origins, only to add to its significance that it was the place where Christ died on the cross. And Muslims have their own narratives that are tied to the city. If I, if I have this right, Jerusalem is the place where the prophet purportedly flew up to God uh, on a horse and conversed with the saints. So all three religions regard Jerusalem as a holy city. And adherents from all three religions regularly make pilgrimage to it. And on top of all of those religious claims are the claims of the Arab people themselves, Christians, Muslims, or, or, or otherwise, who also believe that the land and the city have been theirs since ancient times. And some Arab traditions trace that belief back to the, the Hebrew Bible uh, as well, arguing that when the ancient Israel seized the land as depicted in the Hebrew Bible, they seized it from somebody, and that somebody was the ancestors of today's Arab people, meaning, by this tradition that Arabs, in fact, have the oldest documented claim to that ancient place. 
Jerusalem is a place of deep, historical, sacred meaning for a number of communities. Its importance, of course, has led to millennia of contested claims to that city and generations and generations of conflict that continue, of course, to our day. That conflict is a byproduct of more than greed, politics, and territorialism. It's deeper than that. Jerusalem physically captures a sense of the holy for the groups who lay claim to it. And by extension, it symbolizes something about the identity of each of those communities. The conflict over Jerusalem is constantly creating a profound feeling of displacement in some group. Arabs displaced by Israelites, Jews displaced by Muslims, Muslims displaced by Christians, and on and on and on. To lose control, to lose access to the city is to be displaced, to be cut off from the sacred in a visceral sense. This isn't just about territory. It's about belief. It's about identity. It's about a sense of grounding in the moral universe. It's about a connection with the holy. The depths of the city's importance and the different groups' inability to imagine it as a shared place is what makes the history of Jerusalem so tragic. The conflict around Jerusalem is a particularly painful example of the intense importance of place in our sense of meaning. We are embodied creatures. We exist in time and space. And both time and space are important to how we understand ourselves and our place in this world. Our sense of place in the world reflects and also gives us identity. And when we are disconnected from our meaningful places, we feel displaced, rudderless, vulnerable, perhaps not really ourselves. Though it doesn't compare to the historic tragedy surrounding Jerusalem, I think many of us have felt similar consequences in the year and a half of our pandemic exile, as many of us have been displaced from, among other places, our churches. To be sure, that old Sunday school song is right. The church is not a building. The church is not a steeple. The church is not a resting place. The church is a people. The body of Christ is not a location or a specimen of architecture. It is a community. It's a fellowship. It's a family. But as is often the case in Christian faith, and frankly, in reality, two things can be true at the same time. The church is not a building, and yet buildings and other places can be profound symbols of who we are. They can be the site of our regular encounters with the holy. For some of us, not being able to enter our churches, perhaps not being able to even see them for months at a time, was among the hardest parts of pandemic shelter. Why? Because for many of us, church embodies the holy. It gives physical space to our encounter with God. It is the Lord's house, as the ancients called it. And when we enter it, it vividly reminds us of who we are, to whom we belong, and who is our family of friends. Our churches serve as sanctuary in both senses of the term, a sacred place and a shrine to God's goodness, but also a haven of safety from the more troubling aspects of our lives. When we enter places of worship like this one, we are invited to temporarily remove the burdens that weigh us down out there in the world, to bathe for a bit in the reality of God's grace to imagine a world with a little bit more patience, love, kinship, and forbearance. To gird ourselves for the hardness of life by taking on God's peace. 
and to return to our lives out there stronger than we were before. For many of us, church as place delivers a tangible experience of the sacred. And to be deprived of places of worship makes us feel displaced in the world. But how does, a, how does a place have that kind of power to make us feel whole, to make us feel holy? It does so by appealing to our senses. Under the influence of evangelicalism, much of American Christianity teach, uh, uh, treats religion primarily as a matter of the heart, as a, as a matter of emotion. By contrast, the New England Congregationalists, with which I regularly hang out, the frozen chosen we call ourselves, are more inclined to think of religion as a matter of the mind. In reality, however, genuine religious experience is something more than either one of those options would suggest. Faith is a whole body experience. Something that other Christian sub-traditions and other religions, frankly, understand better than many of us American Protestants. Ornate European cathedrals are not necessarily reflections of human pride or waste. They are sensory expressions of and conduits for the beauty and majesty of God. Catholic and Orthodox Christians use incense in their worship to stimulate the sense of smell to being in the presence of the holy. Thunderous music invites us to hear God's grandeur, the texture of bread and the soft bite of viney drink even get our taste buds into the experience of the divine. The Orthodox tradition describes the house of worship as the nexus between heaven and earth the conduit by which we experience God. The profound visual presentation of different places of worship, the smell of candles, the waves of music crashing on us from piano or organ or guitar. Being in a particular space can convey the presence of God to our senses. The sights and sounds and smells feed our need to experience God in our whole bodies in the real presence of the community of faith. For holy spaces put us in relationship to God in ways that we can feel, not just by connecting us to our senses, but also by connecting us to one another in time. Buildings, lands, cities have history, and these places connect us with that history specifically with the memory of a community of saints and a cloud of witnesses who have worshipped as we do in those spaces. On more than one occasion, I have sat in the old New England congregational sanctuary in which I regularly worship, and I have imagined the generations of people who have sat there before me. These are people like the very rascals I spend my day job studying as a theologian and an historian. This place, Silver Bay, invites visitors to be in relationship with the generations before who have found recreation, holy rest, and sacred connection here. Our places of worship connect us with ancestors in the faith. But some of those connections through time are not necessarily ancient. Some of those uh, some of that history in our places of worship invoke uh, more memories more recent, more personal. I have that experience every time I go back home to southwestern Pennsylvania and descend into the musty basement of Culver Presbyterian Church. That's where our Sunday school rooms were, and the smell of that place takes me back to that wonderful community that raised me in the faith. The current congregation is much smaller, and frankly, there are just as many unfamiliar faces there these days as familiar ones, and yet every time I go back home and descend the stairs into that basement, I am taken back and reconnected to those Christian fathers and mothers who raised me as soon as I entered that place. In fact, I've been surprised that other musty basements also have a similar effect on me. Take me back to the same place. A 
testament of the power of memory and its sensory triggers, yes, but also an indication of just how powerful church is as a place to connect us with the communities of God's people. Now, to be sure, a church building is not the only place capable of connecting us with God's presence. The natural world also functions this way for many of us, a favorite place in the woods, a beach to which we return year after year, a place of retreat like this one. The beauty of all kinds of places can serve as connection with the sacred, a tangible experience of God. But I will admit, while a walk alone in the beauty of nature often leaves me with a vivid sense of God's grand intimacy, it doesn't necessarily connect me with sacred community the way a church. This place, with its clear depth of community in time and place, does. Ultimately, I think that's what's so important about church as place. It connects us through our senses and our memories to communities past and present who gather just like us here. And by extension, to the community past and present who gathers anywhere in God's name. And by extension, to the God in whose name we all gather. Holy space reminds us vividly of who we are and to whom we belong. Now, we should acknowledge that we can easily get carried away with our celebration of place. We risk forgetting why a place is holy, exaggerating its value simply as a possession or an exquisite specimen, and losing focus on the referent who makes it a sacred space, God, as experienced in God's community. It would be reasonable to see that happening in much of the conflict around Jerusalem, where conduit of God has been obscured by ugly politics and territorialism. Similarly, we do well not to uh, confuse an appreciation for church space as holy space with a spiritually empty architectural idolatry. But with proper acknowledgement of that risk, that concern, we also should not dismiss the importance of place to our experience of God. Yes, the church is a people, and the body of Christ is more than a physical space. But a sense of place is important. It can be the nexus between heaven and earth. It's the reason Jerusalem figures so prominently in the pride of ancient Israel and the Jewish community today. It's the reason that the Christian scriptures symbolize the triumphant fulfillment of God's reign with a vision of a new Jerusalem descending from heaven. It's the reason Silver Bay has been a holy refuge for generations of Christians. And it is the reason many of us have felt so incomplete and so displaced for much of the past year and a half until our return to places of worship we love. We are not out of this pandemic. I'm wearing a mask again, which I thought I wouldn't do for a while. Who knows if we will be able to gather like this in the near future, what measures we will have to take to do so, what inconveniences we will have to en endure to enjoy this privilege, and for how long. And yet, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And I am very glad to share the holiness of this place with all of you this morning. Amen.
gently together. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can hear His mighty power and His grace. presence of the Lord in this place. Thank you, James. And if I may just add, just for a moment, the Jerusalem YMCA, really a beautiful building that I had a chance to visit some years ago. The Jerusalem YMCA actually has a beautiful child care program, very large, and it is the one place in the city where Muslim children Jewish children and Christian children gather together with mus Muslim teachers, Christian teachers, and Jewish teachers. It's an amazing place to watch. And it is the hope, it's the hope of the YMCA that their witness to the ability to be together as this Abrahamic tradition of these three groups, it's the hope of the YMCA that that continues to have an effect on the city that has been in such conflict. So if you ever get to Jerusalem, please visit the Jerusalem YMCA. It is a beautiful building and doing remarkable work there in Jerusalem. So thank you for that. Another great connection of how the Holy Spirit works. So we come time to, to pray together. And as we often do at Silver Bay, we have petitionary prayer. And that means that we'll all have an opportunity to lift up something. So what I'll do is I'll start our prayer and then invite you to share, lift up a joy, a concern, something on your part. And after one of us speaks that, we would all respond to that by saying, Lord, hear our prayer. Here's my hope. We are among family and friends. We are among a group of people that come together to worship this morning. And so I hope you feel comfortable lifting up what's on your heart, a joy, a concern, something you are wanting to have us all pray for. And as you pray, we will follow you in support by saying, Lord, hear our prayer. So let us come together in prayer this morning. Oh, gracious God, we give you thanks for this message about the sacredness and the sanctuary of place. And Lord, there are so many places around this globe of ours that need to hear this message because conflict, ideology, so many other issues of politics and religion get in the way and create, create havoc and tragedy in people's lives. So Lord, let your, let your grace and mercy and forgiveness and love reign over places like Jerusalem and other places. And not only in places, but Lord, in our own families in our own institutions and in our own hearts. Let the beauty of your, your word, your grace, your mercy fill us that we might be people who are kingdom bringers, that we might be people who by understanding your word have real patience and forbearing with others and a sense of humility and openness and the ability to communicate and share our love, our compassion and our forgiveness.
for others. For Lord, this is the call on our life as people of faith. So Lord, we, uh, we take some time now to lift up those concerns, joys, things that are on our hearts that we would like to lift up in prayer now. Lord, please send us healing and love and safety for the people of Afghanistan. Lord, hear our prayer. For those in need of justice. Lord, hear our prayer. few names that are on my heart around healing. Katie, Robert, Sally, Jane, and others that, Lord, need your healing hand and guiding touch. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, pray for our young people going back to college, staying home and attending college. Give them strength. Surround them with people that will support them in a very stressful time for our young people. Lord, hear our prayer. this summer, many of them who have now left and some still with us. Lord, we're grateful for those that have served this community so beautifully in a challenging summer. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. Lord, we also give you thanks for all of the volunteers that have stepped up this summer. Many who are here today and around our community who have helped this community deal with all that has come upon us and these volunteers, Lord, have been such a blessing for us. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Lift up the annual employees of Silver Bay and make this all possible. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Lord, I'd like to pray for all of those that are watching uh, this service this morning in their homes and apartments and communities. Lord, bless each of those that are uh, with us virtually healing and hope and inspiration to all of them. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, and I lift up all the families this summer that have laid their loved ones to rest in our memorial garden. All the families that have lost loved ones over this past 18 months. All the new plaques that are up in the back of the chapel. Lord, we ask your blessing upon all of those families that have are grieving and have lost dear family members. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. So gracious God, we lift up our spoken and unspoken prayers. And Lord, I pray for each person here this morning. For each of us, Lord, carries something in our heart, some concern, some health issue, some aspect of our life. 
that, Lord, that we would invite you into a deeper journey with us. So, Lord, be with each person here as we leave worship shortly, as we go out into the world. Let our faith and let our relationship with you fill us so that we are your hands and feet, that we might, through your life and teachings, bring about your kingdom and bring about the abundant life for all. And Lord, we together say the prayer that you have taught us to say this morning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>
perhaps carrying the enormous weight of tragedies unfolding around us all over the world and here closer to home, perhaps carrying the burden of our own personal sadness or anxieties, we have gathered together as Christ has commanded us to do. We have come together in this place seeking sanctuary in God's peace. And having found that, let us go out into the world girded by that peace and sharing that peace with anyone we can enlighten. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Alleluia and amen. Amen. Have a great week, everybody. Thanks for being with us. Hope to see you next weekend.